This is the D6 Generation. Dice are our vice. Creating not too horrible content since 2008. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Oh, I think we're well past that. D6G Hot Hey, welcome back to another PIP. Uh, don't be fooled. Don't worry. It's not going to be just me through this entire mm, moment in time. Uh... I recently returned from the science fiction literature convention Balticon in Baltimore, and it was a great time. I had a blast. Um, uh, we had a booth, uh, Winged Husser. Oh, and by the way, I've been saying that wrong for the last 10 years. It's not Winged Hussar, it's Winged Husser. Um, president and friend and friend of the show and publisher. Uh, Vince Rosebond uh, and uh, friend of the show, Bill Anderson. And uh, we uh, hung out all weekend in our booth and really had a blast. Sold some books, signed some books. That was exciting. Talked to some folks. Um, discussed uh, a, a, an interesting side light. Uh, Bill had one of his friends had just finished... Um, uh, Legacy of Shadow, my science fiction uh, space opera novel, and um, was uh, was uh, intrigued that the aggressive um, alien race in his mind were cows, and that was very intriguing to me because I have a very strong picture in my mind about what they look like. They look nothing like cows, but. It was very intriguing to me that my my writing, which I, I'm describing these aliens the way I see them and the way I imagine they look, and they are looking quite different in other people's eyes. And I thought that was interesting. Um, the con overall was very interesting. It was my, my second science fiction convention, my first being Honor Con many years ago. Uh, when uh, my first book, Honor Among Outlaws, first came out, and I was uh, um, a, a special not 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 an author's guest, but I was invited, and that was excited, uh, exciting back then. Um, that was very specific, though, to uh, David Webb's writing, uh, Honor Among um, Enemies, and you know the whole honor verse things like that. So, uh, and that's military sci-fi and that's a slightly different fandom is what I learned. Um, the, the intriguing thing, one of the intriguing things about Balticon to me was, uh, there was a mask mandate, which, uh, was odd. Um, as many of you know, I have between my parents and myself, I've been in and out of hospitals and other medical facilities, uh, over the past year. And um, become quite friendly with uh, with many medical professionals. And the last medical facility uh, locally in New Hampshire that required masks um, uh, canceled that mandate over a month ago. So at much to the excitement of most of those medical professionals that I know and uh, and, and and became friendly with. Uh, although not all, of course, and everybody has their opinion, and that's totally, totally fine. But this is the first time in a very long time I had to wear a mask, and I found that intriguing. Although not everywhere. You were required to wear a mask in some places and not in others uh, with, um, uh, I guess, the size of the room was was an indicating factor. But then by Sunday, they canceled that policy. So not sure what was going on. It was it was it was. It's very difficult, um, I learned. It was a very intriguing, interesting sort of confluence of 
items for me because, uh, of course, during the pandemic, there weren't any conventions. So I wasn't out meeting and greeting and, and smiling at people and getting to know them and roping them in and describing what we do and, and what I like to do and things like that. Um, and then uh, the pandemic was over and I didn't have to do that, you know, um, uh, with a mask on. I was doing that again. I was out and about and talking to people and uh, enjoying enjoying that those interactions once again. And um, and then in Baltimore, it turned out I had to do both. I was um, I was doing my my you know my whole spiel, but I was doing it with a mask on. Two people with masks on. And that was, uh, it was interesting. It was different. It was difficult, very difficult. Um, but it worked out okay and met a lot of really interesting people and, uh, and had a really good time. Like I said, uh, Vince and Bill and I, uh, had a great weekend, uh, had some good meals, had some good drinks, had a lot of laughs, uh, welcomed a lot of people to our booth and, um, over the weekend, uh, I got to know a lot of the authors who were around us. So if you go to these conventions, which I highly recommend, they're they're all over the place. They're literally all over the place. And if you like reading science fiction and you're always looking for new books, this is a great place to go. A great place to go. Um these conventions are, like I said, they're all over the place. There's BozCon in Boston. There's Confluence in Pittsburgh. There's PhilCon in New Jersey. There's uh, there's this one called SmothCon in Providence, Rhode Island, which is actually a convention about throwing conventions. So if you're interested in starting a convention, you could go there. Uh, you could Google any number of of local conventions and many of them are going to have some interesting guests uh john scalzi one of my favorite authors was at balticana i didn't meet him uh, i never saw him actually uh there were a bunch of others um that were uh that were noteworthy but what i'm actually referring to is the uh the vendor halls and at balticon there were there were three uh, there were two that were kind of like off to the side. We were in one of those. And then there was a large central atrium area that was more of like a, a flea markety crafts fair sort of thing. But there were a lot of booths there, too. And uh, and you'll find a lot of authors, usually local authors, uh, smaller publishers, boutique publishers, some self-published, but mostly boutique uh, publishers. And you get to talk to them directly. You get to ask them any question you want. How did they get into writing? What's their process like? Uh, what are their books like? And uh, as uh, over the course of the weekend, I was talking to all the people that were around us. We had one lady who I, I never thought to interview because I was kind of focused on writing. She had a uh, 3D print booth that had printed all kinds of amazing things that I, I didn't know you could do with a 3d printer. She had like articulated dragons that printed articulated. So literally she's got it programmed in and her 3d printer goes to work and it must've been a huge 3d printer. Cause some of these things were really, really big. And uh, when they came out, they're multicolored. She's, she's, she's printing in multicolored uh, resins and when they came out, they were like fully articulated toys. So like you would hold them up and the tails would wag and wobble. And and, and that was just amazing to me. Um, there were a lot of bookstores, a couple of not a lot, but a couple places, including uh, Wing Tassar, who is now teamed up with On Gaming. So they've got part of their booth is always a uh, hobby. And, uh, you know, and uh, like uh, they had a lot of... Um, uh, they had some X-Wing, we had some Star Wars Legion, we had some really older, uh, older games, uh, Conflict 47, things like that. Um, and then there was a couple others, uh, other booths that were featured, you know, along those lines, but most of the booths were either artists or authors, and so I started walking around and I started chatting with the authors and uh, I started to realize 
that um, this would probably make some really cool content. And I didn't think about it until the second of the last day. And so that night I downloaded a recorder onto my phone and then went back to uh, a lot of these folks and uh, went to them for the first time for a lot of others, especially in the other uh, in the other vendor hall with with uh, with with writers. And I just wanted to sit down and, and chat with them for a little bit. And so I think I, I think I got some really good content. I think I got some really good introductions. A um, lot of really, really interesting people. John L. French, for instance, uh, writes a whole bunch of different kinds of books. And I, I got a cool interview with him. He was a CSI officer in Baltimore, which... I probably could have done without knowing that there had been two murders in the last few years in the parking garage where we left our car. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. So talking to John was great. Um, uh, talked to some some comic book pu- producers, some guys who wrote comic books. A um, couple of these people are also amazing artists. They do their own art. Um, and, and so it was just it was just really fascinating. Uh, it was Also, in the heart of the Baltimore waterfront region, which is where my very first big gaming convention experience was, Games Day in 1999, uh, where I won a bronze Golden Demon for my Divine Wind Space Marine Chapter Squad. And so that was sort of my introduction to that side of the the hobby also, which was very, very cool. And I have very vivid memories of most of that weekend, uh, including swimming in a fountain that I think no longer exists, a big whole fountain complex on the waterfront. And I think it's all built up now, and I'm pretty sure there's a mall there. Uh, It really kind of struck home uh, in my head. You know, 1999 Games Day was, yeah, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, maybe, because I'm really bad at math. Uh, I had to remind myself that was 24 years ago. And the waterfront, although a lot of it is the same, well, a lot of it is not the same. So driving by the convention center was awesome, because I remembered uh, very vividly, again, all kinds of amazing, cool things that happened there that Games Day and the next couple of Games Days, because we went down a few times. Um, but a lot of it has changed, obviously. And the uh, Balticon was actually in the Renaissance Baltimore Harbor Place Hotel, which is a beautiful hotel right across the street from the waterfront. And uh, so that was exciting. I hadn't been in there. We we had stayed at a slightly less expensive, I think a day's in, up the street. Um, uh, Karen and Reese went with me, so that was fun. That made the drive down and the drive back a lot easier and a lot more um, entertaining. Reese loves just going uh, anywhere and staying in hotels and experiencing new places. And Karen loves to do that sort of thing with him also, as do I. But, you know, I was, you know, at the booth, manning the booth, as we say. And so they took scooters and went all over the place. And they went to uh, they went uh, to the aquarium, which is a world-class aquarium, which is interesting because we grew up, you know, close to Boston and the New England Aquarium is a world class aquarium also one of the major um, attractions at the New England Aquarium are the penguins who are pretty uh, pretty much all over the place there's a whole the center of the aquarium is a big penguin uh, habitat uh, so Karen was quite upset when she went to the Baltimore Aquarium and they didn't have any penguins um but uh, the, yeah, so they they went all over the place. They had a really good time. We had some really good meals with them. We had one great meal uh, at Phillips right on the waterfront where Bill and Vince and myself and Karen and Reese all had a really good time and introduced Reese to cran- clan- crab dip and crab cakes. Uh, at 12, he's really starting to kind of expand his palate, which is exciting. So we had a blast. We had a really, really, really good time. And ultimately, um, I'm really, really glad that I went. And I'm really glad that I met all of these neat, interesting people. And I hope that you find them interesting as well. So without further ado, 
Uh, I am now going to introduce you to three very interesting people who may have written something that you just might enjoy listening to. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed talking to them. See you in a bit. Talking with authors today at Balticon, and uh, now I'd like to talk to John L. French. John, how you doing? Oh, pretty good. You? I'm doing great. Um, how's the con going for you so far? It's it's doing well. Doing okay. Well. And um, you're, you're from the area, are you not? Right. I'm. Uh, I live in Northeast Baltimore. Okay. So this is this is my home con. Oh, great. Awesome. So so home home court advantage. Yes. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me a little bit about you and, and your writing. You've got a you got a whole booth here with a, a bunch of different books, which right. looks great. Um, all, all my all my in my booth, I have about thirty five books, uh -huh. all of which I've written, edited, or contributed to. Okay. And, and what, what some, some more at home? Okay. <laughs> and uh, what would you say if you had to like lock it into a vague sense of a genre? Okay. Um, I started out as a crime writer. Okay. And later was invited into anthologies like um, H.P. Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft related material and um, zombies. Uh huh. And um, gradually was invited. You know, I gradually fell into science fiction, fantasy, pulp, and horror. Okay. But primarily, I'm a crime writer. Okay. Um, my background is I'm I'm now retired, but I was a crime scene investigator for the Baltimore City Police Department. Oh, so CSI for, right yeah, there for for over forty years. Okay, and is that that was the inspiration well, for those early um, books? The my very first story came when I thought of what I believed to be a really good ending uh -huh. to a mystery story, and so I wrote the story. And to my surprise, it was published by a small magazine called Hard Boiled, <laughs> a rich created by Wayne Dundee, and was went was continued by Gary Lovisi. Okay. And um, I got good I got good feedback from that, and I started writing more stories. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a couple stories published in Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine. And um, I just, you know, went on from there. Mm -hmm. um, once I had um, a good friend of mine, C.J. Henderson, who's unfortunately passed on, advised me to write the stories all about the same character. Uh -huh. That way, when I had enough of the stories, I could put, put it together in a book. Yep. And I did, and that was one of my first books, was Past Sins, which was the title of the very first story I wrote. Uh -huh. And it's all about a crime scene investigator who becomes a private investigator, a private eye. Okay. And um, at the end, he has to decide what kind of person he's going to be. Uh -huh. So the idea of sins okay. kind of resonates yeah. with the book. And um, I went on to create a character for another small press magazine called um, Frank Devlin, who was known as the Devil of Harbor City, because he was he was basically signed by the police commissioner of Harbor City to clean up crime, however, whatever he had ah, to. Okay. Well, should I dress as a bat? Lurk in the shadows. Well, superstitious criminals are a superstitious and cowardly lot, but I want them to be afraid of a crazy cop with a license to kill. <laughs> you know, and that's uh -huh. you know, okay. That, that's the theme of the thing. And yeah, they, they came out um, in short stories, and when his when Frank Devlin's story was told, um, I adapted it into a uh, novel, uh -huh. and it came out as The Devil of Harbor City. And it has seen three public, three different publishers, oh. and is still going strong. Nice. Okay. And I recently revisited that era of Harbor City uh -huh. with a book coming out. It takes place just after the Devil Leaves, uh -huh. and it's called the it, uh, um, it's called the Wages of Sin. Jericho Sin is sort of a unofficial man for hire. He's a He's not licensed, but uh -huh. people in trouble come to him, and he helps them however he can. Uh -huh. And so he, this is take so, and he's called the Scarecrow because of his appearance, uh -huh. and because his uncle was called the Scarecrow, and he sort of 
uh, inherited the name. Okay. And this all lurks back, goes back to me when, I, as a kid, watching Disney's The Scarecrow of Romney Marsh, uh-huh. which I learned was based on a fiction, a fiction series. Oh, okay. And the name of the Scarecrow was, um, I can't remember the, fir- the first name, but his last name was Sin. He was Doctor Sin. Uh-huh. So these are literary. He's a literary descendant of uh, the Scarecrow of Romney Marsh. Oh, wow. So okay, nice. Tie it, tie it back in. Yeah, so he's called the Scarecrow. He hates the name, but he uses it because he he uses it because it has an effect. Uh huh. Like, Jericho sins not strong enough. Well, it's basically <laughs> he's known as the Scarecrow, and it's sort of like uh, call call some of your friends and ask them, tell them the Scarecrow is here. What you should you do? And he makes a call and he says, "Well, he says I should cooperate or you'll throw me out a window." You know, so that's right. Okay, he's so he's building rap. a rep. He's got the street rep. Right <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And so, um, but um, you know, I also write paranormal investigation. Mm-hmm. Um, I was asked to write a um, a story for a um, a Lovecraft. Um, anthology called Eldritch Blue, mm-hmm. and I created Bianca Jones, uh-huh. a small woman who's a police detective. In the world of large men, she has an attitude, uh-huh. and um, so it turns out it you know it, it worked out very well. And again, CJ said you have your monster hunter. <laughs> okay. I was never I was wasn't in the anthology. Yeah. But I did come up with three volumes of stories about Bianca Jones. Uh-huh. Here there be monsters, monsters among us, and the last monster, which finishes her story. Uh huh. And three spin-off novels, uh, three spin-off um, books, two with two written with Patrick Thomas. Oh. And one is just a small collection of vampires in Baltimore. Oh, good. Nice. Oh, yeah. that's cool. And I've gotten into pulp with characters like the Nightmare, who's been described as the Shadow, if played by Brendan Fraser. <laughs> okay. And the Grey Mummy. Young Brendan Fraser or the, current Brendan Fraser? The Mummy Fraser. Brendan Fraser. Oh, okay. okay. The Mummy Brendan yeah. Fraser. At his peak. Not that he's yeah, not at great. His peak. He's winning awards now. So, yes. you know, no no, no, no shade. Yeah. Um, and um, the Grey Monk, which is set in more contemporary times. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The Grey Monk believes he's the Lord's agent. Aha, uh-huh. okay. You know, so it's there. It's all uh, my father. T- I, I started with a fascination with the shadow and the Green Hornet through my uh-huh. father, who would tell me about the radio shows he used to listen to, mm. and on Sunday afternoons they would repeat these shows. Yeah. So we listened to the Green Hornet, and we listened to the Shadow. And later, my fa- when I got older, my father would find old shadow paperbacks and bring them uh, home to oh, me, and wow. I'd read them. Yep. So I'm very much a shadow fan. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And if, um, you know, I really, you know, and th- this is basically the the Nightmare and the Grey Monk are my homage to right. to this character. Yeah, which is a great side, side note to being an author is yeah. when you have something like that that you love so much, you can continue experiencing right. it. Yeah. And I don't write about the shadow because I don't want to be sued by No, no, of course not. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, the DNA is there. Yes, the yeah. DNA is there. They're, they're sort of cousins. Yeah, excellent. That's great. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to, to um, mention to the listeners or... Well, um, I am uh, an editor of Espec Books. Okay. And um, they put out very nice anthologies. The latest, the latest one I've edited is um, a Grease Monkeys, which is a diesel punk anthology. Okay. Instead of steam, it's fossil fuels. Yep. Yep. And I'm also, as through Espec, I'm also involved in Systema Paradoxa. Which is a series of cryptid novellas. What cryptids are creatures that are believed to exist, but for which there is no scientific proof. evidence that they right. So we're talking Bigfoot, uh, Mothman, Goatman. Okay. Um, and my first one, which was the first in the Systema Paradoxa uh, uh, series, uh-huh. was the Snallygaster. The Snallygaster is an aerial predator that is believed to uh, haunt Frederick County, Maryland. <laughs> and I also threw in the Dwayo because that is a, a, an earthbound predator uh-huh. in the same area. They oh, don't really? like each other. 
and um, it turns out that the main character, one of the main characters there, is Theodore Sin, uh-huh. whose nephew later becomes the <laughs> becomes Jericho, Jericho Sin, Sin in Sin. Harbor City, okay, so, AKA. The scarecrow. The scarecrow. They're both <laughs> called the scarecrow. You know, oh, that's okay. Where he got it. Oh, that's that. That that's is where that's he got scarecrow. it. Oh, that's nice. And Danielle, well, Danielle that's a great tie-in. D- Danielle Ackley McPhail asked me to later asked me to write another one for the the now. It's, it's no, it's no longer around, but it was for uh-huh. the Chessie Con. Okay. And um, so of course it had to be Chessie, the Chesapeake Bay uh, oh. sea serpent. <laughs> and um, I had some fun with that. Yeah. And um, of course. Theodore Sin shows up in that. Oh, nice. And um, sometime in 2024, there will be the third and last Theodore Sin book. Uh Uh-huh. It will feature the Dwayo, and um, it will be called uh, Daylight Comes. Uh Uh-huh. And for all, you know, so for all you... um, all you, you know, all you uh, fans of his music, you know, well, well, daylight comes. Uh huh. You know, yep. That's, yep. Where, that's yep. where the title comes. You've from. got, you've, you've got, you've got, it, you've got it all. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and um, I'm always looking for, you know, um, new subjects to write. Yeah. Um, I, I edit for, you know, I edit for both Pad Wolf and for for Eastback. Okay. And I'm always looking for the next thing. Oh, and I have to give a shout out to. Um, Bold Venture Press, they are publishing um, uh, uh, wages of, The Wages of Sin, okay. and they also invited me into their Zorro anthologies. Oh, really? I have written, there's two in Zorro anthologies, I have written for both, and uh, so, the, you know, that thrill of a lifetime. Yeah. I write Zorro. That's great. I can't yeah. do Batman, and I can't right. do I can't do the Shadow. At least I can write Zorro. Yeah, that's awesome. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with me, John. Uh, I appreciate it, and uh, oh, good luck. I hope the, the weekend continues to go well for you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and now I'm here talking to author Jonathan Soul. Jonathan, how are you? I'm doing good, thank you. Uh, how's your weekend? It's going pretty good so far. Okay. I'm enjoying the con. And are you local or I am, you I'm from D.C. D.C.? Yeah, oh, so that's great. a little great. bit of travel. Bit. Yeah, well, we, uh, yeah. my family just went to D.C. in February. We loved it. We oh, had a great. really good time. Apropos of nothing. Uh, right. Okay, so tell me a little bit about what you have going here in the con. You've got a couple different things on your bo- in your booth. Yeah, I'm a science fiction and fantasy author, and here I just put out my first science fiction novel, a space opera novel, called The Society, um, and this is a comic book I did a few years ago, an urban fantasy comic. I wrote and illustrated that. But oh, you did the illustrations also? I did. Oh, that was more great. of a passion project to get a comic out. Yeah. Um, primarily, I do prose fiction. Okay. Yeah. Um, and tell me a little bit about The Society. That's the novel that you're referring to. Yeah, it's set in the near future. Um, there's an interstellar civilization known as The Society, and it's made up of a group of different races, uh, hominin races, so they're cousins to homo sapiens, to us. And Earth has just discovered them, and it starts right at that point where Earth's first first embassy is going out into the society to okay. see if it's right for us. Um, because on some levels, it feels too much like a utopia; mm. it seems too good to be true, and People so they're more suspicious by nature. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. And there's some things that happen when they get out there. One of the neuroscientists gets involved in a political plot, and she believes some people have uh, copied her memories without her knowledge. And so that brings in some political entry. Mm. And then another delegate is stationed on one of the biological starships. And they're starting to see that uh, one of the primitive planets in the galaxy looks like it's starting to be exploited. And they're not sure if it's the society or another group. And they're trying to get to the bottom of that. Okay. So there's multiple plots going on. Yeah, there are two main characters. Okay. Yeah. and uh, Possible flaws with the society. Exactly. And it stretches from our solar system to a few thousand light years away. Yeah. And and you, this is your first book. This is my so first. So, how long uh, have you been working on it? Uh, this was overall about six years. Six years. Yeah, it took okay. a you know time off during the pandemic and life okay. stuff got yep, in yep, there, yep, but yep, as it does, exactly. Yep. Uh, what kept you writing? Like what? Like a lot of so uh, I have a lot of listeners mm-hmm. who want to be writers, right? And my advice is always you have to keep writing. Exactly. So when things kind of bogged down, what kept you working on the society that brought you to this point, which is really wish fulfillment, right? <laughs> you know, exactly. you've got here, yeah. you have your books, 
and uh, hard covers and uh, and trade paperbacks. And mm-hmm. actually, you look. I got the three different sizes. Size yeah. <laughs> well, that. that's because I grew up reading that mass market size yes, science fiction novel. Yeah. So I only do that for cons because it's just not cost effective okay. to put it online as yeah. well. But um, what kept me going is that my earliest memories are wanting to write. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. from being a kid laying on the on the floor, uh, just drawing and writing stories. Uh-huh. And I noticed whatever I did in life, whatever jobs I had, I always came back to writing just for me. Yeah, yeah. So. I one day decided when I saw that the Kindle and people could self-publish, <laughs> decided that you know I can actually do it. Yeah. And I had some short stories published in, in smaller press zines, but okay. this was my first novel, and yeah. just constantly doing it. Like you said, writing. Yeah. Um, even if you need to write every day, but I didn't do that. But I thought about None it. None of us do, but yeah, we exactly. all say we need to. Yeah. yeah. I thought about it every day, so that, <laughs> exactly. that just kept me inspired. Yeah. Just the the joy of doing it yeah that's awesome now the society I, I assume that's set up like you could now continue writing in that universe yeah, you did the, a lot of foundation work oh but now yeah you there's can a kind whole, of a whole lot of universe building going in yeah. there and the first novel I tried to keep it um mostly looking like the journey of us going out into space uh-huh. and seeing how big everything is yeah. going to be uh, but there'll be three novels. Oh, I nice. try to keep it um, so it's kind of self-contained, so you yeah. get a sense of closure with this novel. But it's definitely open-ended to see what's yeah, going. Yeah, that's that's my next. favorite way to do it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I know it might take me. Well, it'll take me shorter time, but it'll be another year before right, the second yeah. one comes out. Um, and so, uh, so do you have it all? Like, so I've talked to I talk to a bunch of writers, mm-hmm. and I. I tend to I'll, I'll outline one novel at a time, and the rest of it's in my head, which right. isn't great. It's not the way I would recommend. It. <laughs> okay. Do you have the trilogy kind of like mapped out at, someplace you can look at it, or is it oh, yeah. in your uh, head? Yeah, taped on my wall. Actually. Oh wow! Uh, okay. Well, actually, when I started, it was going to be a lot more books because I thought they were going to be shorter, uh-huh. so I was going to do a longer series of shorter books. Okay. And then that just didn't work out with all the viewpoint characters that yeah. I wanted to do in one novel, so I made it one longer novel. So it's about one hundred twenty-five thousand words. Okay. Oh, wow. And okay. reduced it to That's a trilogy. But yeah. the whole series is mapped out, and I had the timelines and everything. You know, and I just, I, I print out the little Bible and have it all taped to my yeah, wall yeah, so yeah. when I'm writing, I can remember. That's okay. So it looks co- like you're trying to solve, like, a serial uh, killer crime at home. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to keep track things. of all the technologies, yeah. all the different alien races and wow, everything. Wow. That's yeah. fantastic. You just can't move. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, and so, so this is a, the completely separate from that, the the urban yeah, fantasy. A, uh, um, what's going on here in case people are interested in this stuff? Well, there's a uh, type of urban fantasy stories like, um, um, I'm trying to think of some authors, like Jim Butcher or Patricia Briggs yeah. that write those con- fantasy stories set in contemporary yes, times. Yeah. And this is a, a young American guy who's hiding out in Japan because he found a supernatural object and a lot of people were trying to mm-hmm. track him down. Yeah. So he's hiding out in Japan, but he still can't help the fact that he likes to help people. Mm-hmm. So he gets caught up helping somebody um, actually uh, save their belly button. There's a, a myth over there um, that during thunderstorms you should sleep on your stomach or this guy, Kaminari Sama, will come and steal your belly button. Ah, and I lived over there fine. for a while and I always found it interesting and I kind of <laughs> Put it into the plot yeah. of this story. Yeah, that sounds very interesting, and the the artwork is great. I mean, this could be right out of a, like a sci-fi like game cover, you know, right? Kind of thing. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, when did you do this? A while ago? Or? That was about in 2016. I think. Okay. Yeah, um, that passion project right before yeah. I started writing the novel, and just wanted right. to kind of mm-hmm. get a comic get, book get out. Your, yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. And that's then awesome. when. When I came and decided to do this, I realized, oh, I still have issues left. I can bring them in. Oh, multitask. Exactly. It's always nice. That's great. Uh, Is there anything else you'd like to say to people or or, or anything else you'd like to mention about your work or where you think you're headed or where you want to go? Um, Well, I... Not just science fiction, but also fantasy. So I'm kind of taking a break, the science fiction, and write a little fantasy, then go back nice. to the science fiction. Keep it fresh. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because yeah. that's what I love to read. I, I love to read both okay. equally. It just yeah. depends on my mood. So, yeah, yep. um, absolutely. It's the same with writing. But I am uh, committed to finishing this and getting it out in the next couple awesome. years. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for thank sitting down with much. me. I appreciate it. And uh, good luck for the rest of the weekend, Jonathan. Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm talking to Michael Watts, and uh, you're here at Balticon. Michael, how is the con going for you so far? Uh, pretty good so far. Yep. So okay, and uh, so tell me what it is you've got going. There's comic books here, so is that like what are you doing here? Yeah, well, basically, I'm some of my original comic, uh, The Legend of the Crusaders. Okay. Written by me, drawn by others. Okay. <laughs> that's 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 how I do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm also helping to promote another comic book called Jonathan Quack Up of the planet Weralt. Okay. Uh, made by a friend of mine in California. Uh, <laughs> that guy I never met named Ray of Raytunes. Uh huh. Okay. Raytunes.net. <laughs> okay, Raytunes.net. Yes. And so tell me a little bit about your comic book. Well, uh, The Legend of the Crusaders takes place on an alternate Earth. Okay. Uh, you have all this, like, this George Lucas-style technology, but you still also have magic. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things man has done now, we've finally learned to colonize the galaxy. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> we've been able to mass-produce, you know, FTL, faster than light <laughs> technology. Yep. So by the time the story starts, man has pretty much colonized the galaxy for thousands of years. Uh -huh. And our main character is from one of these colony worlds called the Elysium. All right. He's a soldier. He's sent to Earth by his government to warn us of this big, you know, impending doom that will uh -huh. consume the entire galaxy. Okay. And his mission is to recruit an army that will save us all. All right. The big catch is... He's the only guy from Elysium that can serve in this army. Oh, that, that seems like it would be a problem. Yeah. yeah, everyone else has to come from someplace else. Okay. <laughs> so what? Is, so he has to travel the galaxy and yes. and recruit an army. Okay. Yep. What What is the mechanism for? He's the only one from Elysium that can do it. Uh, the Elysians, his people, they have what are called the Holy Writs. They're their equivalent of the Bible. Uh huh. <laughs> and it, they're. It's, because it, it just says so in the Holy Rest. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's part of the religion is yes. that they can. Okay. Yeah. And um, can you give a little idea, like, who's the big bad guy? Or is that yeah. not revealed yet? Or you, would bad, it spoil I I, it? I think I can get away with telling you this. Okay. <laughs> the big bad guy is an industrialist. Uh, okay. Who owns companies uh, all across oh, the world. Oh, so galaxy. he's an, a war, uh, 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 an enemy from within sort of thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, does he have an army that's like, so what's the, how does the conflict, how is it shaping up in the story? Well, I mean, when, uh, I don't want to give away too much. No, yeah, don't, don't, yeah, no, no, no. It, uh, my inclination is to ask for the whole story. So you, you yeah, don't, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> um, so it looks like um, you've got four, no, three, is it three so far? Three, three. so far. I'm, yep. My, my plan is to make this a five-issue story arc. Okay. And uh, how long have you been working on this? Oh, I've been working on this for years. I first got this idea back in college. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yes. And what do you do? Um, for, do you do another job, or is this kind of like what you're doing full-time? Yeah, I'm a full-time commercial driver. Okay, awesome. Okay. And you, like, work on this at night, and, yeah, that's got to that's gotta be hard to schedule. Work on it in the break room <laughs> in, yep. between, in yep. between trips. So it's a, 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 a work of love, absolutely. Yes. Okay, and is this your first outing, this con, or have you been? Have you I've, had a few of these for a while? I've been to other cons. I've been to Hampton Comic Con, uh, Clandestine Comics hosts a convention every every six weeks. Oh, oh really? Oh, yes. that's great. Yes. And are you from the the area then? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm from Baltimore. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners uh, about you, what you're working on here, what you have in the future? Uh, in addition to making the Legend Crusades like an ongoing series. I do have other, you know, other projects coming yep. down the pipeline. Uh huh. <laughs> One's like a more traditional superhero type story called The Three. Okay. Uh, go to back, back to zero dot net for more okay, information. Okay, back to zero dot net is where we're going to send you for any more information on this stuff. Right. right. Awesome. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks sure. for sitting down with me. It's been really nice to meet you. Great. Thank you. Good. Have a good rest of the con. You too. 
ladies and gentlemen. I'm back with uh, Patrick Thomas and uh, for another conversation with an author here at Balticon. Uh, Patrick, how are you doing? I'm good, Craig. Okay. Thanks, it, thank you for ben, having it me. It was great to meet you. So we're all here in this uh, the w- main book area of the dealer's room here. And uh, and so you have quite the display going on. How many books do you have here, would you say? Um, I've written over 50 books at this point, and I've been in over 60 anthologies. Uh, I, I would have to count. Uh, I, over, probably over 50 books that are on the table. Okay. And, and, and did you build this yourself? I'm just... I designed it myself. Okay. I, had, I had a handyman that did some work for us. I'm like, could you build? And he's like, yes. And actually, he did a great job. He... Um, he added the idea of putting the the uh, banner stand the banner on the side, post, yep. and um, he, you know, managed to. I came up with the idea because this extends the table mm. far enough forward, so I get two books in front. It looks very underneath. much like a Parisian book uh, book dealer cart <laughs> to me. Yeah. That's why you've got these. They've got little little boxes that open up during the day along the Seine, and that's what it reminded me of. So. Um, so it's great. I, I I wish this wasn't an audio format. We could show like the whole. It looks like a little bookstore that's just totally unfolded. Exactly, but then I'd have to wear pants. That's true. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, yes. Okay. So then, so Patrick, tell me about yourself. Um, I'm uh, an author. I write uh, fantasy, uh, science fiction, horror, mystery, uh, most humor. Uh, and a lot of my work, and I also write uh, a Dear Cthulhu advice column. So uh, I guess technically I, I, I dish out advice on behalf of the great old one. Uh, Where could people go to find uh, your column? Um, actually, for the most part, it's in the collections. It was in a bunch of different magazines, most of which, uh, being small press, have uh, gone the way of small press magazines. But it is on the radio every month on a weekly show. It's a monthly segment. Really? Called Destiny's the Voice of Science Fiction. It's on uh, WUSB radio station in Stony Brook, Long Island. Um, if you plug in Destiny's the Voice of Science Fiction, they do put it up the week after as a podcast. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. So they can, they can listen to that. Um, and... Uh, uh, there are six collections, going soon to be seven. Um, some of the magazines might still have some of the uh, letters up on the websites because some of them, you know, they did it as a segment okay. for the magazine itself. But uh, I keep meaning to try and see if I can do it like a weekly go uh, comic where you know you put a letter up instead of the comic uh-huh. kind of thing. Oh, I just wow. that'd be neat. <laughs> time, you know. We, we all have wonderful, great ideas and only so many, you know, free hours yeah, in the week. Well, with 50 bucks under your belt, you would know that, I think, more than most. Uh, so tell me how you got started as a writer. Um, well, let's see. You said you wanted my original story. Yeah, your earlier. origin story. Here so we go. I, I was bitten by a radioactive planet which uh, flew in my window <laughs> and inspired me to dress up like an exploding planet. Yes. Uh, no, um, I've... Written since I've made up stories since I was a kid, and uh, in high school I started doing a little bit of writing. Wrote for the school paper, was an editor in college, had a chance to submit to a couple magazines that did poetry and literary magazines. Had a couple stories published, and just kept at it. And like many writers, I had that short story that turned into my first novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, after several years, uh, that got published, and I've just kept going. Okay, great. And so it keeps the voices in my head a little quiet. And that's I've heard that. That's good. Yeah, my voices just won't be quiet. But uh, but it's nice that it'll help you out that way. Yeah, if I can um, only do some of the typing. And and <laughs> that's right. Uh, so where did where's your inspiration come from? Where are the where are these stories popping out, or is it all just the voices in your head? Um, I think uh, for me at least, you know, you see inspiration or you get ideas. Um, Everywhere, you know, yeah. you'll someone will say something, and you'll go, "Ooh, that could be good." I have a children's book coming out with uh, Leo Connell. I did the writing; she did the art. Called uh, Fuchsia, the Mermaid Who Loves Pink. And John and I were riffing this morning, and he said, "You know, uh, the fuchsia is bright," and I'm like, "It's yeah, the future is pink." And I'm like, "Okay, that could be a good tagline for like an ad for the book," you know, because. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like that in particular were stories I used to tell my kids when they were little uh-huh. um, about a mermaid who went around painting everything pink and then um, the next book is going to be Fuchsia and the Three Pigs uh, which was you know something and even um, I write the kids books as Patrick T. Fibbs I have a, a book I have a 
it's the second book will be out. It'll be a series then of the Baby Bear Mysteries. Not Baby Bear. He hates that. Um, but when I used to tell my kids stories, I would change them around. My wife would, but that's not the right story. I'm like, that's my story. And I always felt Goldilocks was a juvenile delinquent because she breaks into the house. Yeah. She steals their food. She wrecks their furniture. And then she squats in their house. Um, so in this, I actually took that and ran with it. And he captures the burglar who runs a burglar in Goldilocks. And uh, because of that, uh, people think he can solve mysteries. So he sets up a detective agency, as kids are wont to do, uh-huh. uh, in his treehouse. Uh-huh. With his next-door neighbor, Rapunzel, and his best friend, Not-So-Bad Wolf, <laughs> who you may have heard of his dad, Big Bad Wolf. Uh-huh. He's in prison um, for this insurance scam where he knocked on these three pigs' houses for the money. And uh, they get hired by their first client, the Little Mermaid, because she didn't get asked to prom, so she didn't get her voice back uh, from this water witch who flies around town, not on a broomstick, but on a jet ski. <laughs> so... Uh, that's very so subversive on all these fantasies yes. and fairy tales. But p- part of it came from the kids. Of my kids' bed- yeah. bedtime stuff. Yes. You've got lucky kids, I would have to say. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lucky dad with that. And actually, what was nice is when I wrote those, they were young enough to still be read to. Um, so uh, my first two metal readers, they got, you know, I like I, I read them to them when they were done. And, yeah. Uh, I was able to get feedback from them, what you know, what they liked, what they laughed at, what they didn't. You know? Oh, that's awesome. So. And um, like when we were talking earlier, you, there, there's like a core series of books that you have that. Uh... My, my main series is the Murphy's Law series, and there's the Murphy's Law universe. It's about a bar in Manhattan that's owned by a leprechaun. <laughs> he bought the place with his pot of gold. So rainbows leave people in trouble to the bar where they can get help from people like Hercules, who's the bouncer, Dionysus, kind of wine, and some other things, um, who's one of the bartenders, and various people of myth, legend, and everyday New Yorkers come in. Stuff happens, nine books summarized really quickly. Uh huh. <laughs> um, and then there's two books that take that series 30 years in the future where they go out into space, not in starships, but barships. Oh, um, okay. Um, and then several characters from the universe get their own spin-offs. So there's over 20 books uh-huh. in the universe. Oh, that's awesome. And, so. and, and for people who are looking for, like, uh, like, you know, if you like this author, look, at, you said there's a couple authors that you feel are kind of like their style or their themes are rolled up into that well, series. Well, actually, I, I, I think I'd use uh, David Sherman, who it, he just passed away, was a wonderful military science fiction writer, although he did some vampire books and some traditional military Terry type books um, gave me the best blurb ever mm-hmm. he uh, said something to the effect if you take um, Gaiman's American Gods and mix it with Robinson's Callahan's Cross Time Saloon and put it on Pratchett's Discworld you get an idea of, Pat- of Thomas's Murphy's Laura best yeah. blurb ever yeah oh, so it. he you know I, 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 I claim you know uh, I don't claim to be as good as any of those no. three writers but you uh, know but what? I, but I have, Someone but I have else said met, that. I have met all three, and they're all very nice, very nice people. Oh, I mean, did you? Oh, that's Terry lucky. Terry passed. Right. Um, but I, I have met um, Spider Robinson and I were supposed to be on a panel together. He was late coming in, unfortunately, <laughs> but I did get to talk to him afterwards. Uh-huh. Um, I have got to hang out. I have a fun you know, gaming store. I got to hang out with him at Book Expo, like, ages. I've been doing this a while, uh-huh. a long time ago, before <laughs> cell phones. Yep. And just hung out with him and a couple other people. He was just the nicest guy. And Frank Miller was yeah, in yeah. the mix. And then a woman came up and like asked uh, Frank Miller and Neil Gaiman, like she was talking to us. And I, I was there doing a signing in a different part, uh-huh. not quite the level of, <laughs> that, of Frank Miller and Neil Gaiman. And she's like, can I get a picture? And I stepped out of the way. She's like, no, I want you too. I'm like, oh. So I'm in the middle. My arm is around Frank Miller and Neil Gaiman. They are, you know, we smile. It's like a film camera, or maybe it was a digital camera even yeah, back yeah. then. I, I gave this woman my name, my phone number, my address, Uh-oh. and I'm like, I will pay you money for this photo. Yeah. And I, she never, never got back oh, to me. Oh, wow. So, but it's out there somewhere. Yeah, but it was kind of it was kind of neat. Uh, That's to awesome. Do. And, and uh, I went to a signing uh, that was before Terry Pratchett became as huge as he became in America. He was already, mm-hmm. you know, the best author in Britain. Right. And it was in a store called Science Fiction Mysteries and More, which was wonderful to me when I was starting out. And he was there for like three hours, and there were probably only a little more than a dozen of us. Oh, really? And got to just hang out with him and talk oh, for wow. like two, three oh, hours. Oh, that's a dream. It, yeah, it was, yeah, it was wonderful. And what was neat is... Um, when he, I brought books to have him sign, he had stamps like with Unseen University 
<laughs> and like so the different offices he would like sign the book he'd take the stamp uh-huh. out oh that's and put great the stamp. yeah and it was like so cool so i said you know i was asked to have this yeah oh of course <laughs> yeah i would hope oh that's great uh, well, thank you for sitting down with me for oh, a little bit. You, is there is there anything me. else you'd like to add before well, I can, we? I can. T- I mean, you know, you I, I, I don't want to take up all your. You're bandwidth. a talker. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to take up school? all your bandwidth. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Well, thank you. And uh, if anybody wants to look for you, where what's the website? This well, is all going to be in the show notes, also. Excellent. We'll have them count to ten, uh-huh. and then uh, uh, no, um, patthomas.net. Okay. Um, DearCathillo.com goes the yeah, same yeah, website. Yeah. And uh, Patrick T. Fibbs for the... Uh, the children's, children's books. books. Okay, great. Uh, dot com. Okay, well, so. thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there you go for the first batch of Balticon uh, interviews. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope they were enlightening. Uh, little nuggets here or there about people's processes and journeys. Um, and I will... Uh, have a few more of these uh, next time. I think I've got three more. I think I lied at the beginning of this segment and said there were three in this one. Uh, and as it turned out, I had seven total, which is great. So if you are interested in any of these, please check out the show notes where links will be provided to all these different authors and their various media presences. And uh, have a good night. That was a D6G Achievement unlocked. You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by emailing us at info at the D six generation.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.